Okay, we've got this recorded now. Um, so welcome to Wednesday. This session is about the RBR Quartz BPR0. Uh, this will be presented by Greg Johnson, the president of RBR, who's been heavily involved in the development of this product. And I think you'll really enjoy this presentation. A couple of quick notes. We are recording this session. So, uh, so the questions that you ask will be great and we'll be able to answer them for you and for all of your colleagues that might be interested in hearing your same questions. Um, we will be uh, posting this onto the website following this call. So you can go to rbr-global.com, click on webinars, and you can see a copy of this if you want to review anything we said, or if you want to pass it on to a friend that might be interested, you can pass on that link. Um, for questions, you can ask questions in the chat window of the Zoom session, and I'll try to answer them in real time as we're going. For any questions that are too complicated to answer by text in the chat section, we'll have plenty of time at the end uh, for questions answered. So you can write in your questions by text, or you can save them and ask uh, verbally afterwards. Um, and again, just remember that we have a webinar series every Wednesday, same time, same date. So Wednesdays, uh, noon Eastern time uh, in North America. The next one, actually, I'll be hosting, and it's going to be about the RBR CODA TODO, an optical oxygen and temperature sensor, and how it works on vertical profiling and long-term mooring. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Greg. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, good night, and uh, I hope you're all uh, safe and well in this very unusual situation. Um, can I just get confirmation from you, Eric, that both the video and audio are coming through okay? Yes, uh, it seems like it's all good. You're ready to go. Okay, perfect. So uh, welcome everybody. Um, we're going to talk mostly today about uh, the so-called BPR Zero. Uh, which is an instrument that we've been working on in conjunction with a number of researchers for, well, uh, quite some time actually. And so I wanted to start going back a bit further in the history to talk not about a zero drift bottom pressure recorder, but to just uh, give everybody an overview of the options available for measuring pressure at all. Um, Pressure gauges are used in all kinds of applications uh, and oceanography is only a small section of them. Within oceanography, uh, of course, there are two main drivers for measuring pressure. Uh, one is typically shallow deployments uh, that may be uh, short term. And the other is deeper, more arduous deployments, uh, which are typically long term. And these then give rise to the cost of deployment, and the cost of the instruments sometimes can become just a small factor in the total cost of uh, getting the instrument onto the seafloor. So if we talk first about uh, piezo-resistive pressure gauges, these are uh, very economical. Uh, we make uh, simple single channel pressure gauges that are a few thousand dollars. They have moderate accuracy, uh, it might be 0.05% of full scale, um, although typically when they come out of the factory, they're about five times better than that. Uh, the resolution is moderate as well. And uh, they're, they're widespread and made in tremendous quantity, not only for oceanography here, uh, but of course you will have all seen uh, discussion of making ventilators um, in the automotive industry, uh, all kinds of applications for that. Quartz-based resonators have been around for some time as well. Um, as opposed to economical, I was trying to find a, a good word to say it, and I know that we've got some quartz manufacturers online, so I think I'm just going to leave it at not economical. However, the accuracy is very good, and uh, what's really interesting about them is that it is possible if you take a quartz-based resonator where you're looking at a resonant frequency and trying to measure it, uh, to integrate that measurement over a period of time and get exceptionally high resolutions. Uh, this allows you to make very, very small uh, measurements of changes in pressure for whatever uh, physical reason they may be occurring. So to talk about um, how you might make those measurements, I'm gonna start off with something that's probably familiar to everybody, which is an analog pressure gauge. And uh, many of these images are shamelessly ripped 
off the web or from uh, Parascientific. Um, and uh, there are a number of credits at the end. But if you see your image go past and you don't see the credit, uh, you should see it by the end of the, uh, uh, by the end of the presentation. So this analog gauge is made up of a so-called Bourdon tube. A Bourdon tube is a cylindrical tube uh, that has been bent uh, typically into a C shape like this, although there are other geometries which are useful. And uh, it's also been flattened. So the, the uh, cross section is no longer circular, it's usually elliptical. And the uh, large axis of that ellipse is perpendicular to the display. That is to say, if we started off circular and then we flattened it this way, uh, that would be akin to what's being, sorry, and then, yeah, it's difficult to show in, in 3D and I'm uh, unable to see my own image, so you'll have to take my word for it, but it's been flattened. And what that means is that as the pressure is applied to a fluid that is inside this tube, the tube tries to both straighten and also to return to circularity. And uh, a analog pressure gauge is a very simple converter of that motion using this uh, simple gear mechanism into a rotary motion. So as the Bourdon tube tries to straighten, that link pulls on the sector pin, which has a fulcrum in the middle, and that allows you the uh, pointer to rotate. The nice thing about Bourdon tubes is uh, providing you make them with the right materials, you can achieve uh, very high repeatability. And uh, so then you really want in a solid state or semi-solid state sensor to think about how to measure either the motion or if you're not going to permit it to move, then at least uh, the stress at the end of that, at the tip of the Bourdon tube. In Parascientific's uh, case, the way they do that is by using a quartz crystal um, in a, a conventional arrangement like this where the load is applied over those uh, resonators. And by applying the load, you're able to change the resonant frequency. The quartz crystals have a very high Q, that is to say a very narrow resonant band. And so you're able to measure that uh, wavelength that uh, wave train that's coming out, assess its period, and uh, from that derive the applied load. And furthermore, with not too many, usually around uh, eight or nine coefficients into a polynomial, uh, able to extract the equivalent pressure. However, the quartz is itself a very good thermometer. And so you need a secondary channel, which is going to measure temperature in roughly the same location, in order to correct the force sensing channel. Otherwise, you're going to find that your signal is dominated by temperature effects, which, to be honest, is the same with a piezoresistive gauge as well. If you don't measure temperature and correct for it, uh, you will find that your real signal is swamped by temperature effects. The arrangement inside a, uh, a Paros high pressure gauge is that they take this Bourdon tube uh, principle and they restrain the end of it by attaching it to that uh, tuning fork arrangement to measure force. And then they co-locate as close as they can the temperature crystal. So the parascientific gauge has two outputs, which are frequency. One is about 40 kilohertz, one's about 170 kilohertz, and they're corresponding to the pressure and temperature signals themselves. And again, once we've calculated the temperature, which uses about four, four parameters in a, in a qubit polynomial, then with a total of 12 or 14 coefficients, um, you can actually calibrate this. And you end up with a remarkable sensor that has uh, very good accuracy, usually about 0.01% full scale. Um, but the repeatability is uh, exceptional and if you apply the right uh, counting technique to it or uh, wavelength measurement technique, then you're able to obtain uh, exceptional uh, resolution as well. So we took this a few years ago and built it into an instrument that's fairly compact in size. It's about 60 millimeters in diameter, about half a meter long. And uh, this is the RBR Quartz BPR. This is intended for, as a bottom pressure recorder. There's no point really in trying to attain these levels of resolution if you're going to stick it in a uh, water column 
that is dominated by sea surface movements. Unless you're interested in long-term stability, uh, we are sometimes interested in that, and so we make an instrument called the quartz Q, which is intended for shallow water uh, low drift measurements. Uh, but it's only made out with a plastic housing, whereas this instrument is titanium. It's rated down to 7,000 meters, which is the maximum we can get the pressure sensor for. And it uses our own electronics around the pressure and temperature waveforms that are coming out of the quartz resonators. Um, and over a one second integration time or a sampling period, the integration time is slightly shorter than that, we can achieve a 10 part per billion resolution. 10 part per billion is sometimes hard to quantify. And I know everybody thinks of pressure in their own uh, specialist units. So in America, for instance, the parascientific is sold in units of PSI. Uh, we tend to work in D-bar because we're in the oceanographic community. Um, and, uh, but if you uh, talk to many people, of course, water pressure, if you're in Japan, you will see all the water gauges are in megapascals. And then people start to talk in terms of pascals or uh, kilopascal differences at the bottom. Uh, 10 part per billion, just to convert it into a, a, a length measurement, is about the same as saying uh, 10 microns of water level change measured from a kilometer under at the bottom, uh, a kilometer underwater. So if you're a kilometer deep, you can see a water level change, uh, which may occur due to the water level changing, or it may occur due to seafloor geodesy. That, that is to say, the seafloor may be either dilating or contracting um, of about 10 microns. So that's an instrument that uh, has been deployed in a number of locations. And most of the data that I'm going to show you today comes from Earl Davis and uh, the Pacific Geoscience Center in uh, Sydney, just outside Victoria in British Columbia. Um, and he's been working for most of his career in, uh, in locations around the world. And this data actually comes from a unique application of quartz sensor where it's de deployed not only on the sea floor, but also down a borehole. <clears throat> the deployment down the borehole is interesting because if you pack the borehole and seal it off to um, as much sea floor uh, or water column effects as you can, then you will still see um, the changes. Well, let's start off with what the seafloor one sees. The seafloor one see that is deployed here uh, can see the water level changes that occur due to a tsunami passing overhead. You can see a very strong tidal signal, of course, um, but you can also see the tsunami. However, in the brown plot, you can see that when you're deployed down the borehole and you pack it so that those water level changes are, um, you're measuring a combination of that and pore pressure, then you're able to see the pressure in the formation. And that allows you to use a pressure sensor as a vertical accelerometer and to be able to see seismic waves in, in that case. Um, the killer with all pressure sensors is drift. And uh, piezo-resistive sensors drift quite, um, well, let's say ferociously. Uh, quartz sensors are much better. But if you're interested in a measurement that only might, um, you're looking at a signal that might be a few millimeters of uh, equivalent water column over the course of a year, and you've got drift that is usually occurring at centimeters uh, over the course of a year, uh, just due to the instrument itself, you need to find some way to deal with that. Uh, this plot is the relative correction technique that is used on those cork projects, where they've got a seafloor pressure sensor and they've got three borehole uh, pressure sensors that are at different depths. And so uh, this is time across the horizontal axis. I think they've, uh, we've lost the, the time scale, but uh, from that square drop, uh, the step change about a quarter into this graph to the recovery on the right. That's about a period of half an hour. And so what happens is hydraulically, an ROV flies down to the bottom. Um, it uh, changes a three-way valve. And instead of the instruments which are at the screens, three different screens at different depths, 
Uh, instead of those instruments measuring that hydraulically, they are now coupled to the hydraulic pressure at the seafloor. This allows the seafloor instrument to be used as a relative reference. Uh, the offsets can be measured between those four sensors and aligned and then thereafter uh, corrected for, and that can be done periodically. Of course, um, this is what happens now at the top of that. Um, after the period, we return them to normal pressure, and you can see that the <clears throat> there's two phenomena. On the right-hand side, you can see that these now achieve uh, good alignment um, to, to a fraction of uh, you know, almost a hundredth of a KPA, um, however, you can also see that there's quite a long transient response, and uh, we'll talk about that a bit uh, further on. But this is a great technique if you can afford to send an ROV down to your deployment periodically, and you can uh, balance the tension in the control room between the ROV pilot who would like to be out of there as quickly as possible, and the scientist who would like to hold the instrument um, in that reference position for uh, 15, 30 minutes uh, in order to make a good offset assessment. Now, um, I'm probably gonna skip over this, um, but this, uh, this is really talking in different units, again, about the kind of drift uh, that we can see. And so this is a long time series, uh, 11 years of data. And we are typically seeing on that seafloor graph, which is the one to be paying attention to, a drift of about one and a half centimeters per year. So I'm going to jump over this one and talk about a second instrument that came out of that first one. This is called the Quartz APT. Uh, APT in this case being acceleration, pressure, and temperature. This instrument is uh, considerably longer, almost a meter in length, but the same diameter, still only 60 centimeters in diameter. And it is using uh, the parascientific DigiQuartz pressure gauge uh, at the top, and you can see the pressure vent in the bottom left of the slide. So that is designed to measure seafloor pressure. However, the conical appearance of the, uh, the Ogive tip should give you a clue that this instrument is designed to be pushed into the sediment. And so it's usually flown down by an ROV and inserted down into the sediment, almost a meter. The cable is mounted at right angles so that any seafloor currents don't disturb the measurement and it lies flat on the surface. And there is a, a quartz-based acceler quartz accelerometer mounted at the bottom of this instrument, just inside that plastic tip. Uh, that is to say, just above that plastic tip inside the titanium pressure housing. This allows us to get acceleration and pressure, again, at about the 10 part per billion uh, resolution. If you were to talk about that at uh, DC, then obviously this accelerometer becomes a tilt sensor, and the tilt resolution is nanoradians. That is to say, on the orders of tens of microns tilt over a kilometer long baseline. Um, but this instrument's able to run much faster than one hertz. We can run this up to 16 hertz, and that allows it to be used uh, in a true, as a true accelerometer um, and, and measure a number of, uh, basically seeing what's going on inside um, the seafloor as well as the water pressure changes that are above it. And what's found and known here is, again, that pressure sensors um, can be driven by acceleration as long as those seismic waves are occurring in the, the correct the, the direction that we're sensitive to, and that acceleration can be driven by pressure. Uh, when we look at this plot, uh, which is comparing the APT and the BPR, um, the most important part probably to look at at the bottom is the coherence, which shows you that in the band between about a tenth of a hertz uh, nominally, one hertz to a tenth of a hertz, the coherence is approaching one. And that means that pressure is really a proxy for acceleration over that bandwidth, and acceleration is a proxy for pressure. So we get back to this drift problem, which occurs in uh, every sensor, but still uh, afflicts us in quartz-based pressure measurements, because we're looking for signals in sea level rise or geodesy, pardon my typos, um, of millimeters per year. 
and the drift is centimeters per year. However, not all sensors behave like this, but we're very fortunate in that the, the drift of a quartz-based sensor is largely offset-based. That is to say, it doesn't matter uh, where you are in the uh, span, where you are in the range of the pressure sensor as to uh, how you're going to correct it. You can correct it at any point you like, at any pressure you like, and then apply that offset correction to uh, the full span. Now, we saw earlier that Earl Davis did these seafloor comparisons where the delta between what was on the seafloor and down the borehole was on the order of tens of meters to maybe 100 meters maximum for relative alignment. Some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Glenn Sasagawa's work from Scripps. Um, it was probably about 10 years ago that I was in his lab and saw his deadweight tester that he'd made, which was quite cunning. I'd never seen a deadweight tester done quite like it before. He took all the extra weights off it and so he had only one weight on it and a motor drive to be able to spin that dead weight uh, just in the same way that uh, you or I would in the lab um, and then disengage the drive so it's freely uh, sitting on its uh, water suspension in the piston and so forth. And uh, that allowed him to have a reference measurement that was on the bottom, again, switch hydraulically between the marine pressure measurement to the dead weight tester measurement. And depending on the weights, uh, you could nominally have a, a zero D bar delta between those two pressure measurements. I don't think he ever tried to get the precision of, the, uh, of that to that level, but uh, that's one of the principles. And I think he'll probably be able to talk about that later if he's on the call. However, more recently, there's this, been this idea floated of a so-called A0A. Uh, I find the nomenclature a little confusing, to be honest. Um, because whenever we talk about making a reference measurement, the idea, the idea of this acronym is that instead of uh, making a measurement at uh, uh, the nominal uh, pressure that we're deployed at, as Glenn is doing, uh, we're going to switch the instrument to making a measurement at zero instead. The reason for doing that is that you can then make something which is mechanically much, much simpler. You still need to have a hydraulic uh, system to be able to, uh, or some kind of manifold and uh, three-way valve. And you, of course, still need a reference. But the clever part of this idea is that the reference measurement uh, could be the atmospheric pressure that's inside the pressure housing. That is... Well, it's called zero, but of course it's about uh, 10 D-bar, assuming uh, on the day that you bottled up the instrument before it went down. And so the idea is that periodically you switch the instrument from measuring the seafloor or the, the marine water column to measuring the internal pressure of the instrument. And your reference measurement for that is a barometer. And that immediately begs the question of why are you using a barometer? Because it's got the same problem of drift, but it doesn't. Because drift in the quartz-based sensors, and indeed in most sensors, is a proportion of full scale. And so if you can use a barometer where the full scale is limited to effectively 10 D-bar, and then you can use that uh, to make a correction that is going to remove the drift by something related to the proportion between the barometer full scale and your instrument full scale. So if you're deployed in, and you have a 7,000 meter instrument with a 10 D bar barometer, and they both have intrinsically the same drift as a function of full scale, then you would be able to see something like a 700 times uh, improvement, all other things uh, being equal. Then the problem is that we need to switch the marine parascientific quartz sensor from seeing 7,000 D-bar of water pressure to seeing atmosphere. So uh, this is a schematic uh, taken from Wilcock, Manalang, Jeff Cram, Mike Harrington, and the whole team um, over there who uh, built an instrument using our electronics, the parascientific sensors, and uh, their own kind of uh, pressure housing. And, uh, and, and their own complete instrument design, really, I should say, uh, only our electronics were used. And uh, this was done and deployed on the axial seamount. And they've actually done something interesting. They put two marine pressure sensors in. 
Uh, that's not strictly speaking necessary, but as an experimental technique to evaluate the drift of multiple instruments at once, it's certainly more economical than building multiple instruments. You can see uh, one of the things that I want to, to highlight is so the, the marine pressure is applied at the seawater oil interface on the right hand side in yellow. It comes in through a three way valve, and that valve applies the pressure from the marine water column through to the parascientifics, which are the black and white radiant uh, cylinders in the top left. However, when the valve is rotated, then this uh, measurement is done of the atmosphere inside the pressure housing through that oil overflow reservoir. Uh, the oil overflow reservoir is vented, but of course we do have uh, this need for the reservoir because the, no matter how incompressible the oil is, um, when we rotate that valve, the dead volume that is inside it uh, needs to go somewhere, and uh, so it gets dumped into that tube there, but the back side of that tube needs to be open to ensure that we're making measurements of the, uh, of the atmospheric pressure. And that is largely the concept behind which we were asked to develop um, this complete package, uh, the so-called BPR0. And so what you have in front of you in this picture here is an instrument that's about 140 millimeters in diameter, about 700 millimeters in length, and it has uh, everything that is necessary to uh, permit the A0A technique to be uh, made manifest. Now, I may be able to draw on my screen without, ah. Now, it looks like that's going to be, as usual, uh, something that Zoom won't do. Uh, it's possible that you're able to see my mouse cursor. Uh, so if the mouse cursor is visible, on the right-hand side of this instrument is the pressure port. And uh, the pressure port in this instrument is not vented to uh, seawater because the problem with a open connection is that over uh, a number of cycles, depending on the dead volume of that three-way valve, you end up with seawater ingress down the lines of, that you're trying to keep uh, corrosion free uh, using the hydraulic oil. And so what we have on the outside is instead a bladder, uh, which I'm holding up in front of me on camera. Uh, this bladder is uh, large enough to be able to contain about a thousand pressure cycles of uh, 7,000 dbar to the surface and then can be replaced. And a thousand typically, well, it's nominal usage would be about one cycle per month for this calibration reference. So a thousand month deployment, mm, it's not too bad, I think, for most of us. The pressure then comes in through that hydraulic line that you can just see. It goes to the three-way valve and then it is directed to the parascientific, which is the tubular um, pressure sensor uh, in the bottom position. You can see above it that actually the frame is designed to hold two. And that's exactly for uh, Wilcock and Co, who are still interested in doing uh, two marine sensors side by side, even though the instrument uh, will by default uh, just come with one. When we switch that to the atmospheric pressure section, then the oil is bled out into this oil reservoir that's in red at the left-hand end of the instrument. And that's vented. And, and so the blue uh, cuboid shape is the parascientific barometer, uh, which is able to make that reference measurement. So this entire thing is housed in titanium. And usually when you open the instrument, you really don't see uh, very much of the internals, uh, except for the oil purge reservoir and a connector. So um, we're able to do still the 10 part per billion resolution, um, but we're able to remove most of the drift uh, that occurs there. And I may have a plot of that um, from Wilcock and, and uh, et al's uh, deployment. Of course, the, the other question when you've got an instrument that's deployed on the bottom is uh, how are you going to get the data? And so the instrument's deployed to, uh, designed to be deployed on an observatory, but it also may be deployed in a standalone method using uh, an external power pack. 
And we have two of those available. One's called the RBR Formata, which is the same size as the uh, DPR0. And the other, also the same size, is called the Savata, which has both power and uh, storage capability. And this is an interesting example because if you're deployed at two, four, six thousand meters in a standalone uh, situation, then maybe every year or every two years, you'd like to go out with an ROV and pick up the data. But ROV time is very expensive, and so we don't want to have you at the bottom having to use, uh, uh, fly the ROV down there and park it for 20 minutes, half an hour, sometimes much longer, depending on the instruments that you've used in the past, to download that data. Particularly because you're not really helping with the power situation. And so the idea of the Savata is that the ROV can fly down a replacement Savata with a new battery pack and a new uh, empty memory and simply swatch, swap over from one Savata to the next. And those of you who are old enough to remember the concept of sneaker net before internet, it was that the quickest way of getting a gigabyte of data anywhere was simply to pick it up and carry it. And so the ROV version of that is to take a Savata to the bottom of the ocean where we, in most part, don't have effective communications. Here are some more views of the inside of the instrument. So this is the top end cap and uh, a couple of things to highlight. First of all, the handles are mounted uh, to make it easy to uh, affix to a bottom frame, but also easy to open. We want to avoid using a threaded seal if we can and uh, just have a bore seal with backup ring. Uh, but that leads to its own difficulties in getting the instrument open or closed. And so this allows you to stand on the bottom handle and pull on the upper handle. There are some locating pins to ensure it goes back together in the same orientation. And you can see some energizer batteries. These are not intended, there are eight of them. These are not intended to run the instrument. These are purely to keep backup measurements running uh, while the power supply is changed over uh, and, and just end up uh, as a little bit of uh, um, an insurance policy. The tubes in the foreground in that holder are desiccant and there's enough there just to keep the interior of the titanium dry no matter what uh, conditions it was on the surface when you sealed it up and of course once the titanium is sealed there's no more uh, leaking or um, sweating as you would have with a plastic case in shallower conditions. This configuration is shown with some MIN-K cable connectors on the top, which are the choice of Ocean Networks Canada, um, but we'll also do the instrument with uh, MCBHs if you prefer. This is the other end uh, showing that bladder. And so this is, uh, removes the possibility of water ingress um, and uh, uses this reservoir. It also allows us to prepare the oil in advance and pump it down uh, so that we remove all dissolved gases from it. Because we're going to be exerting a step change of thousands of d-bar in 50 to 100 milliseconds, uh, we want to ensure that there's no cavitation uh, and, and bubble formation inside the line. So we like having a sealed hydraulic section um, that never gets salt water inside it. Just to the right of that mount for the bladder, you can see another port here. Um, RVR instruments always have a design when we thread them closed to release the O-ring before we release the thread. It's been a very important safety feature uh, that very few people have ever noticed over the years. <clears throat> the reason for that being that if an instrument does flood at depth for any reason, the water that you bring to the surface is slightly compressed and you've effectively got a rocket on your hands. And so you don't want to unthread that O-ring um, after the, uh, sorry, you don't want to uh, unscrew the top cap of the instrument and have it fly off as a projectile. So we always release the O-ring first before the threads disengage. That allows any water that's inside or any compressed gas to squirt sideways in a much more controlled manner. In this instrument, because we don't have that ability with the thread, we've got a pressure relief. And so if the instrument does compress at all, 
uh, that valve is one way and uh, will ensure that you don't have something dangerous on your hands when you bring it to the surface in an unknown state. All of the rest of the uh, features of the instrument are really exactly the same as you would see on any of our other RBR instruments. So we have USB-C on the inside. Uh, those MinK or MCBH connectors can use uh, RS-232 or RS-485. We do have an ethernet option as well for direct connection to the observatory. Uh, we have both the Sfamata and Sabata external power and power and download packs. And so uh, short of actually showing you one, uh, I'm gonna say thanks uh, to everybody who's uh, really been involved in this, uh, particularly on the west coast of Canada, Earl Davis, beg your pardon for the typo there, um, Bob Meldrum, who was uh, his engineer for many decades, Martin, Joe, John, um, slightly further south in Seattle, uh, William, Dana, Jeff, and Mike, um, also in Seattle and uh, at home at the moment, Jerry and Paul, and uh, the entire team at RBR who's been working on this for many years. Now, if you're interested, I can show you a real unit. Let me see if I can do that. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Okay, um, I, uh, Eric, can you pin me or spotlight my video? Yes, I will uh, pin you. I think you're pinned now. Okay, ow. <laughs> um, so what I have here, let me see if I can get this uh, up and running. What I have behind me on the table is a BPR0 in a Perspex case. Uh, this was built for demonstration at, uh, uh, as a trade show uh, unit, and so please don't uh, expect that we're going to get to any great depth um, in Perspex. Um, just waiting for this to fire up. Okay, so um, it's actually a little bit difficult for me to see my own image. Looks pretty good field of view, Greg. Great, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm running this off uh, an external power supply uh, at the moment. Uh, but this is the instrument with the two grab handles at either end. Uh, usually, a pressure housing would be uh, this pressure housing, but it's much more interesting to look through the Perspex one. Uh, so uh, starting from the right-hand end, we've got the MCBH connector uh, that we're using. We actually have two of them mounted on each instrument. That allows us to have a battery pack and an observatory. So if you are interested in uh, uh, having a longer term backup plan to uh, a trolling accident or any kind of network outage on the observatory, that allows you to run for several years without observatory power, but it will use the observatory power if it's available preferentially. Uh, inside that, then we've got this top housing with the AA batteries, uh, the desiccant, and the short cable harness that connects the top to the main instrument. We've got the uh, pressure purge, uh, presser, the oil reservoir rather here. And I have one separate for, from here. So it's very simple. Um, the pressure line comes in the back and what we put inside this is actually a standard oil spill cloth. So this is designed to wick up any oil. You take it out, pull it out of the holder and replace it, and uh, wrap it up again, and put that in. 
And this is, of course, vented to make that atmospheric connection that we were talking about. Uh, the barometer is here in blue. We've got one marine uh, parascientific in this instrument with the slot for the second one and the hydraulics and probably also see uh, the valve on the back. And so the hydraulic pump uh, piping is all rated to uh, 7,000 meters, uh, except for that purge line, which is just plastic because we're at atmosphere. And then we have a variety of electronics doing, uh, doing the necessary. Um, I think that's probably about all I have to uh, show off at the moment. But if Eric has been busy answering questions, um, and uh, there are any that uh, still need answering, I'm, I'm happy to do so, or entertain any questions from the floor by voice or, uh, or otherwise. Yeah, so Greg, I'll start. There are two questions that were just posted uh, just a few seconds ago, so we haven't addressed them yet, and I think you can address them well. Um, I'll, I'll read them here so that people on the video can hear, and then you can answer them. Um, a question from Dana is, does the bladder distort the pressure that the sensor sees, and does that change over time as the bladder empties? That's a good question, Dana. So the instrument is uh, intended to be um, mounted horizontally, uh, not vertically. And uh, we haven't yet done the final checks uh, to make sure the, the horizontal mount is important because um, it allows us not to change the head that's present on the instrument um, due to that oil disappearing. Now, uh, Matt Watson might be online. If he is, he can remind me how much oil we use for each pressure cycle. And I think at the moment, it's on the order of 10 to 100 microliters. Um, but it, uh, I might have that number wrong um, because I, I remember the thousand cycles, but I don't remember the absolute amount. So it is something that we hope not to see. Uh, obviously, that would be a, uh, a mistake if the instrument doesn't. Uh, does change its head or apparent head um, by doing that. <clears throat> the, uh, Greg, the next the, question is from John Benest, which is, does RBR offer post-deployment calibration, which would provide an upper bound on the system drift offset or gain over the deployment period? Yes, so we can absolutely do that. Um, it would also be possible for that to be done by Paros. We have a, um, once you take that oil fitting off, we have a adapter that uh, mounts in the end. And this allows you to apply a deadweight tester or any other pressure controller uh, to the instrument in order to do a full calibration. So the, uh, the bladder is usually has this kind of appearance and that can be undone and then gets replaced uh, with the necessary parts out of this adapter which come with it. Okay, the next question uh, is, um, how does this system work for shallow water deployments in terms of issues for growth, wider temperature range, and change in salinity? So one of the reasons, um, uh, I'm not gonna be able to go back in my slides quickly enough not to waste people's time, but one of the things that you may have noticed if you were observant in the uh, pictures of the BPR instrument earlier, is that we had an anti-fouling screen over the pressure port. It wasn't particularly because we were intending on doing shallow water deployments. It was because even in deep water conditions, there, are, uh, there is biological activity. And so we use a uh, uh, cuprous bronze mesh just to try and keep that to a minimum. Um, we also recommend that people don't orient the instrument facing upwards or else that pressure port just gets all the uh, all the snow falling on it. Um, Mike, uh, in the shallow water deployments, we wouldn't typically uh, go to the expense of a titanium instrument. I don't know what you mean by shallow, um, but the point of this bladder is also that the marine growth is uh, prevented from having just a direct connection on a small pressure port and would have to apply to changing the compliance of the bladder um, in order to have a really kind of deleterious effect. Um, the wide temperature variation, that's no problem. We've used uh, these instruments uh, in, in uh, kind of, we calibrate them from minus five to 35 degrees um, in a methanol bath. 
uh, and they're typically deployed, of course, uh, not much colder than minus two. Um, and the salinity variation doesn't bother us at all. There's nothing here that's going on. Of course, the, the relationship between uh, pressure and depth is much more complicated, um, but that's going to affect everybody if you have a water column with varying density in it. We do have the shallow water instruments, the uh, quartz Q, which is designed for shallow water work, and it uses the cuprous nickel mesh uh, to, to good effect. Greg, great. There's one more question about, um, is the unit calibration free or how often should it be sent back for calibration? Uh, the, the calibration, is the unit a calibration free unit? Well, the, the point of, uh, of the A0A correction is that you are in effect uh, removing the primary, mm, the primary drift of the sensor over time. And so you can, can send it back to us for a full assessment. Um, but if you're really just looking at uh, its behavior uh, with respect to offset drift, you can do that with the barometer yourself and the instrument can do that itself. So there isn't any need. We don't foresee many people sending them back to us for calibration. Um, the oil fill reservoir, um, oh, I see Eric's, uh, Eric's replied to that, yes, a thousand cycles. So a thousand months, um, it gets, uh, I don't know, we should do a histogram of how many people on the, on the line would get out to retirement with a thousand month deployment. Okay, that's all the questions we have. Um, if there are any others, you can, oh, let's see, we've got one more here. Share any sample data from the field that shows the resolution of the instrument meeting the specs. Yes. I, I put this presentation together in a slight brush, as is probably obvious, um, not realizing that I'd uh, um, left myself too short a time. I can certainly, we will append that to the recording or insert it into the recording and maybe make it um, visible. I think, Eric, we have a dedicated page on the website for the BPR Zero, and we'll put that, uh, put that data up there. Yes, that's right. Of course, if you go to products and look for RBR Quartz BPR Zero, you'll find that page with the data sheet and we'll put more specifications and data there. And uh, thank you to those of you who are sending me private comments as well. I appreciate them and I'm seeing all those. Okay, well, thank you everyone. Thanks, Greg, for doing this presentation. And uh, thanks everyone for joining. We've had uh, more than 100 people sticking around uh, the entire time. Uh, please remember that this will be recorded. You can um, share it with your friends if you think they might be interested and join us next week for the talk about the RBR CODA, TODO, uh, looking at dissolved oxygen measurements in the ocean. Thanks very much, everyone. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. You're most welcome. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye, Anand.